Hello, everyone. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what part of the world you are in. And welcome to this very interesting webinar entitled The Role of Pharmacists in the Prevention, Screening and Treatment Management of HIV, an international update. This is a really interesting uh, webinar, not only because of the role pharmacists can play in HIV management, but also because um, of the day today, which is the World AIDS Day. Uh, I will be moderating this webinar. Uh, my name is Victoria Garcia Cárdenas, and I'm the chair of the Pharmacy Practice Research Special Interest Group of FIP. So today we have a really interesting and um, wide range of panelists from different settings and different countries, which I will be introducing uh, very shortly. Just a few announcements before we start the webinar. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded and live streamed uh, in YouTube. Uh, the recording will be available on our website, which, which you can see on the slide. Uh, you are uh, welcome to uh, post your questions in the Q&A chat box, uh, which is provided um, uh, in Zoom. And you're also welcome to send your feedback uh, via uh, the um, email, uh, which is specified on the slide. Uh, if you are not a member of FIP, I strongly encourage you to become an FIP member and you can do so uh, using the link provided um, on the slide. And also just reminding that uh, certificates of attendance will be provided after uh, this webinar. Uh, for today, learning objectives, we have a wide of objectives that we are we will be able to meet after this uh, webinar. So the first one is to describe the burden and characteristics of HIV globally. We will also aim to understand the possibilities of involvement of pharmacists in the clinical care of people living with HIV. And finally, we will be able to describe the role of pharmacists in pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, related services. This is our program for today. We will spend uh, 90 minutes uh, talking about uh, different topics. So we will cover experiences and realities of stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings. We will also see a case study of pharmacist initiated management of uh, uh, pre mark therapy. We will also see how pharmacies uh, in hospital settings can improve HIV patients uh, life. And we will also see pharmacy delivery to expand the reach of PrEP in the USA and Africa. After the presentation of our panelists, we will have a bit of time uh, to uh, have a Q&A session. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to our uh, first uh, two panelists for today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ororo Lawrence managed the Getting to the Heart Stigma project at the IAS, which seeks to facilitate effective and sustained change to reduce HIV-related stigma by strengthening the global and localized evidence and catalyzing communities of practice by engaging diverse stakeholders. Uh, she has nine years of experience in program management, health and health financing policy, and quantitative and qualitative research. She holds a PhD in epidemiology from the University of Basel, and she has a master's in international health management from the Imperial College of London. We also have Nelly Barrier, who is a project manager in the HIV programs and advocacy department at, at IAS the International AIDS Society based in Geneva in Switzerland. She holds a master in health economics and health politics from the University of Lucerne in Switzerland. She manages the IAS, me and my healthcare provider campaign, which recognizes frontline healthcare workers who deliver HIV prevention, treatment and care, and other services to key populations, often in the face of discriminatory laws and stigmatizing traditions and belief systems. So although this uh, presentation is pre-recorded, um, our panelists are with us today, so you are more than welcome to post your questions as we go. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. 
My name is Nelly Barriere, and I am the project manager at the HIV Programs and Advocacy Department here at the IAS, International AIDS Society. The IAS, Me and My Healthcare Provider Campaign, celebrates healthcare worker champions who provide stigma and discrimination-free services to key populations and promote efforts to increase access to these services. We know that healthcare workers are the backbone of every effective HIV response. Healthcare workers at every level shape and influence how and where communities seek services. This includes a person at the gate, or the information desks who provide directions, nurses, peer support counselors, pharmacists, and clinicians. Every single worker has the opportunity to make or break a visit to a healthcare facility. Every single worker has the opportunity to enable a stigma-free and health-enabling experience for everyone. This is particularly crucial for people associated with marginalized or criminalized communities who have often overcome internalized or social barriers even before taking steps to walk into the facility. This campaign, the IAS Myanmar Healthcare Provider Campaign, celebrates the efforts of healthcare workers who do the right thing despite pressures to stigmatize or discriminate from prevailing social, cultural, legal, and other norms. We salute these individuals who are remarkable and we wanna learn why and how they have the courage and vision to provide stigma-free services in spite of disenabling environments. So far, through this campaign, we have celebrated efforts in 24 cities from 17 countries around the world. And this year, we have launched a new round of the campaign in the following locations. Brazil, Mexico, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, Kenya, Malawi, South Africa, and Zambia. If there is a remarkable healthcare worker that you would like to nominate as part of this ongoing campaign, please reach out to advocacy at iasociety.org. In the following short film, you will hear and see examples of good practices from Indonesia and Brazil, the two previous cohorts that we had. Each healthcare worker in this film has demonstrated compassion and leadership in providing stigma-free services and have been appreciated by the communities they are working to serve. We hope that this video and the campaign will continue to celebrate leadership and inspire more healthcare workers to champion stigma-free and accessible services for all. My name is Aris, I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I'm a drug user and uh, I'm living with HIV about 16 years. My name is Lucia Ang. I come from Indonesia. I work at a provincial pharmacy warehouse in Papua. Untuk eh, populasi kunci itu mempunyai hak yang sama dengan yang lainnya untuk mendapatkan pelayanan ARV. HIV stigma is a uh, difficult make me my living difficult. Uh, my country drug user is a criminal. I decided to nominate Lu Lucia because I have on ARV treatment about 13 years. And before I moved to Papua province, I'm always get a stock out in every year, and, uh, but after I moved to Papua, I never got a stock out ARV. I think it's uh, very important for our community. It's 
stigma dapat menyebabkan pasien dengan hidup dengan HIV akan mendapat akan susah mendapatkan akses untuk ARV. Meu nome é Luciene Mila da Silva, tenho 44 anos, moro em Camaragibe, trabalho na Policlínica Alessia de Andrade. Eu sou portador de HIV há basicamente 5 anos, descobri em 2014 e desde então faço tratamento na Unidade de Saúde Alessia de Andrade. Faço a entrega do medicamento, digito, agendo as receitas, marco consultas também. Trabalho com as médicas também. Então, eu a indiquei porque eu acredito no seguinte, para se trabalhar na área da saúde, e principalmente com esse tipo de público, tem que se trabalhar com amor, porque muitas vezes a pessoa já está com o psicológico abalado, a aceitação é muito complicada, e uma receptividade positiva pode mudar uma palavra, uma conversa, e é isso que eu sinto com ela. Ela sempre me atende muito bem. Ela sempre está disponível, ela sempre está com um sorriso, ela sempre está para me receber, não só a mim, acho que aos demais também, sempre com a simpatia ímpar. Ainda existe muito preconceito, porque as pessoas, a sociedade ainda tende a rotular as pessoas portadoras de HIV. Então, por esse motivo, muitos preferem se preservar, manter em silêncio. É, com medo do retrocesso, né? O que eles acham pior para eles são não contar com a família, não poder contar com a família, de jeito nenhum. Eu gosto do que eu faço, amo o meu serviço. Esses 15 anos, é tudo que eu faço é por eles, no, no, no local de serviço, né? Procuro sempre ajudar o máximo que eu posso. Falta um estímulo para eles, né? Falta uma pessoa que converse com ele. Muito gratificante, né? Quer dizer que estou fazendo bem meu serviço, espero continuar assim e eu agradeço muito. Independente de qualquer orientação sexual, o paciente tem que ter respeito, tem que ter um atendimento com respeito, acolhimento, todos iguais, todos iguais. I hope you've been inspired by what you have seen. And you might have noticed that in the video from Brazil, the nominator preferred not to appear on camera. Unfortunately, due to the fear of being recognized and stigmatized once the campaign was over. HIV related stigma is still an Achilles heel of the HIV response. It drives people underground and away from the services. Policies alone do not address the stigma faced by people accessing HIV services. Finding access to friendly healthcare providers who are knowledgeable and accepting of key populations is in fact the key. So please join me in celebrating the tireless efforts of the individuals in this film and so many others who are doing the right thing in providing stigma-free services despite and not because of prevailing pressure. If you are interested to know more about the IIS Myanmar Healthcare Provider Campaign, the work of the IIS in the area of stigma, please visit www.iasociety.org or join the conversation at hashtag part of stigma. Specifically, if there is a remarkable healthcare worker that you would like to nominate as part of this ongoing campaign, please reach out to advocacy at iasociety.org. And now I will pass over the microphone to my colleague Tessa, who will speak to you about the work of IAS Heart of Stigma Project in consolidating evidence on stigma measurement in order to objectively assess HIV-related stigma in research 
and practical settings. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly, for the introduction, as well as uh, for presenting the work that we have been doing with the Me and My Healthcare Provider campaign. As we have a broader discussion about the role of pharmacists in the HIV response, um, I think it's very important for us to talk about HIV-related stigma. Um, and before we do that, I think it's really important for us to define what we mean by that. And um, HIV-related stigma really is a, a dynamic process of devaluation, where a person's value, a person's position in society um, is really devalued on the basis of certain attributes that they have, uh, whether that is, um, you know, um, their youth um, or their woman, uh, who in some societies may, may have a lower social state, uh, status compared to other members of the society, or it could even be uh, uh, being a member of, key, of a key population, being um, a drug user, being someone, um, a man who has sex with men, um, and, and, and what have you. So all of these different attributes are, um, are used to define uh, a person's value in society and impacts eventually the way they're treated uh, within society. And IAS is very aware uh, that this has a major impact, uh, both on the, 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 the self-worth and the sense of self of uh, people who are living with and vulnerable to HIV, but then equally on the experience with the, with the healthcare sector and with, uh, with individuals such as yourselves. So based on this, the IAS started a program called uh, uh, Getting to the Heart of Stigma. And this really focuses on trying to identify how best to know when we see stigma, um, to be able to measure it, but then equally to know what is best practice in uh, reducing stigma. So this program is focused both globally and we've been doing a global systematic review uh, and also focuses on four different African countries, Kenya, South Africa, Malawi and Zambia. Uh, based on this, we're working with uh, me and my healthcare provider to identify uh, case studies of people who have done the right thing in um, reducing HIV-related stigma in the face of societal um, societal norms, um, difficult le legal situations, uh, and uh, outside of, of what, what is typical in, in their workplaces. Um, so uh, uh, very happy to, uh, to, uh, to be presenting here and uh, happy to take any questions that you may have um, uh, about the work that we're doing as well as how uh, we can work with each other to be able to get to the heart of stigma. Thank you. Good morning. Good Thank you, Nela and Tessie, for an amazing presentation and definitely uh, really good to see frontline uh, workers, which are not often recognized and definitely very inspiring uh, videos. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to our next panelist, uh, Sam uh, Mutli. Uh, Sham is a community pharmacist in the Durban South Basin area. His academic background includes a Bachelor in Pharmacology, Bachelor in Pharmacy, Postgraduate Diploma in HIV, uh, Masters and uh, PhD. He was recognized as the South African Pharmacy Council's National Pharmacist of the Year in 2008 and Community Pharmacist of the Year in 2019. He served as elected member of the South African uh, Pharmacy Council and he is currently the joint chair of the Pharmacy Stakeholders Forum Price and Regulations. Shan regards himself as a dedicated healthcare professional with a passion for patient care and believes that pharmacy has a major role to play. He's involved in many projects focused on clinical outcomes at a uh, practice level. So welcome, Sean, and we are looking forward to seeing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, and thank you for that um, massive introduction. Um, greetings to uh, colleagues from all over the world. Um, thank you to FIP as well um, and the digital team for this invitation to present uh, this very important uh, South African initiative. 
Uh, it's a privilege to be part of the panel uh, today, um, especially on this uh, very significant occasion of International AIDS Day. So let me move on to my first uh, slide. Um, so my presentation will attempt to paint a picture of the South African HIV context, uh, make a case for community pharmacies involvement um, in this new and innovative solution, and then briefly outcome, uh, uh, do an outline of the um, PMAT project as a case study. Um, so the, from a context point of view, um, there are 7.8 million of South Africa's current population of 60 million that are people living with HIV. We have a very high prevalence of 20.4%, which certainly makes um, reaching the new UN AIDS 2030 target uh, a real struggle. However, we do have one of the largest ARV programs in the world with currently 5.6 million people on treatment. Next slide. So this study by Van Skalkvik uh, and his team uh, published in 2021 suggests that while we do have a large percentage of people living with HIV being fully aware of their status, we are well short of the target of people on treatment or virally suppressed as depicted by both the orange column that you're seeing and next to it, the green column. This challenge is not merely uh, confined to rural population, as you would expect that where the services are poor, but it's reflective of the major cities in our country. And you can see Cape Town, uh, Durban, Ekaterini, where I am, uh, Johannesburg uh, and Pretoria, all listed um, on, these, on these graphs. Next slide. So Van Skalkvik and his team uh, estimates that 73% of people living with HIV in Johannesburg were diagnosed with 65 receiving ART and only 54% of those on ART achieving viral suppression. Clearly, the situation points to finding a new solution and making optimal use of healthcare resources at hand. And I think this is the low lying fruit for us as pharmacists. With this in mind, pharmacy took the initiative to map out areas of need and link them to pharmacy services. As in this case, you see the city of Johannesburg and you can see community pharmacy outlined in the city. Next. So this strategy is also very consistent with the WHO global recommendation and guidelines on appropriate task shifting for more efficient use of other healthcare professionals outside of those that are currently involved in HIV AIDS management. Next. So expanding access in task shifting is not new. California was the first state in the US to enable pharmacists to prescribe both PrEP and PEP without a doctor's intervention. South Africa has been training nurses through a program called NIMAT, very similar to the PMAT. Nurses initiate and manage 80% of the current public sector HIV patients in South Africa. Now they go through a five day training program that includes a competence assessment after six months. And this is all done under the supervision of a HIV clinician. Next slide, please. So South Africa has a very enabling regulatory framework within our national drug policy, which dictates that prescribing will be competency-based 
and not occupational. So prescribing is not confined to any particular profession and therefore it's easy for us to cross over. Further, our pharmacy council regulations allow for the issue of a section 22A15 permit after accreditation of a supplementary training. We have effectively used these permits to deliver multiple interventions in pharmacy in South Africa. And these include um, family planning, the PHC authorized prescriber, primary healthcare authorized prescriber. Currently, we use the same permit to do COVID vaccines in South Africa and the community pharmacy is one of the largest providers of COVID vaccines in the country currently. And hopefully we will move on to the PMAT program. Next. So pharmacy also provides a very unique opportunity for multiple engagements with individuals that may require HIV intervention. We currently see more than 100,000 women seeking emergency contraceptions per month at a community pharmacy. This presents a very unique opportunity to engage both the recipient and their partners. We see patients seeking interventions in family planning, our expanded program in immunization, minor ailments, chronic medication, wellness screening, and in other areas all of which presents multiple opportunities to engage on HIV. Next slide. So the focus of the PMAT program is really the missing middle. Some 2 million patients not on treatment. These are men that are reluctant to utilize current services. And combined with a very high rate of teenage pregnancy, treatment interruption, for example, during COVID, patients not getting their medication, and then very inefficient public service, pharmacy is an ideal disruptor. There has been no new innovations in the past few years, and PrEP and PEP is hardly featured in a country with a high burden of infection. Next slide. So the Independent Community Pharmacy Association introduced the PMAT project through a very interesting collaborative model called the Expanded PrEP ART Innovation Consortium or EPIC. Next slide. So this consortium brings together the Southern African HIV Clinicians Society, a society that really has been the forefront of the HIV pandemic and intervention in the country, writing protocols, advising government, et cetera, together with the Wits University Health Research Unit. We have Vula Mobile, which is a referral platform. So connects the pharmacist to the education sector, and to the GP network, for example. Digital Health Cape Town captures patients' healthcare records. And all of this is tied into the Pharmacy First Working Group, which is both the chain pharmacies and the independent pharmacies that makes up the basis of the service provision. This is done through a grant from the USAID. Next slide, please. The key objective of the collaboration focuses on an expanded network of ex expertise pharmacies, a central disease management platform, and an electronic referral link if needed. Next slide. This is a slide just to give you a brief overview of the curriculum that was designed in the first year of the EPIC program before we started the training modules. Next slide, please. So these modules provide for 160 notional hours of face-to-face -face or digital training, at least 14 MCQs 
case studies, assessments, and a final examination that pharmacists are expected to pass at a at an 80% rate. We always make it difficult for pharmacists to get certification. Training manuals and facilitator guides are provided by subject and methodology experts and accredited by the South African Pharmacy Council. Next slide. So patients that are eligible to access the pharmacist and the PUMAT program are governed by very strict protocols and guidelines. PrEP and PEP are offered to negative patients, first line to positive patients over 15, and ARC for reintroduction of patients in the event of them interrupting treatment or being referred from a third party source. Next slide, please. So there's exclusion and referral protocols, which applies to children, pregnant women, CD4 of anyone that's under 200, those at WHO stage three or four, and those with opportunistic infections are all referred through the network through the clinician society expert. Pharmacists are encouraged to identify and refer patients with STIs or other comorbidities. So outside of a HIV intervention, there's also the issue of identifying and referring other types of disease programs. Next one. This is the current treatment guidelines, which I'm sure uh, others will talk about uh, in today's discussion. Um, they're all in the first line, so pharmacists are allowed to prescribe this after their training. The second and third line are excluded, and this makes up the referral network that we talked about earlier. Next slide. So this program is well supported um, by um, in-house marketing, et cetera. But before I get there, um, these are some just some data that we've put in together while the pharmacists are waiting for their training program to be approved by the Department of Health through the DG. Uh, Council has already provided the board notice for implementation. While we're waiting, we have enrolled and started um, a pilot program with around 600 patients and hopefully some data will come through that. Next slide. So this is some of the material uh, in-house that pharmacists will have um, put out into their pharmacies as posters, as pamphlets, uh, and as information cards around their pharmacies. You can see it's quite funky and attractive for young people or people that might require a service to come in and participate. Next slide. All of this is combined together with digital communication, Zoom training, uh, and the PMAT pharmacist has easy access to the GP network via the clinician society. Um, we are quite confident that in 2022, once the permits are issued and the program goes live, we will have huge success in overcoming and providing access to um, millions of patients that might need the service. Next slide. Thank you very much. And, um, and I hand over now to um, the, the coordinator. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you very much, uh, Sham. Uh, really interesting to see uh, the overview of the HIV context in South Africa, which is definitely key to understanding how such a holistic uh, program uh, such as Primark uh, fits into that context. And very encouraging to see how a community pharmacy is helping or is contributing to address uh, this uh, problem. So thank you very much. And now we are going to our, with our next panelist. I'm very pleased to introduce you to Pilar Taverner Bonastre. Pilar uh, studied pharmacy and became a hospital pharmacy specialist in 2016. 
after four years of residency training. Since then, her practice has focused um, in HIV patients and others who require hospital dispensing medicines. So she's also a member of the HIV coordinating group of the Spanish uh, Society of Hospital Pharmacy. So um, Pilar today is going to talk about how a hospital pharmacist intervention can improve uh, HIV patients' uh, quality of life. So thank you very much, Pilar. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for your presentation. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm Pilar Taverner, a hospital pharmacist from Hospital Universitario Arnau de Milano de Lleida. Um, in this IPB International Day, I would like to present our contribution as a hospital pharmacist to improve the IKB patient's life. In next slide, you will see um, where do we work. First of all, I'm glad to share with you our infection disease unit. Probably it is not the best building or space for attending our patients, but what I'm really proud of is that we uh, attend as a multidisciplinary team, our patients, and we think that this is a good advantage for all of them because they can go just to one space to be attending for all the professionals refers to IKB attention. Also, as for us as a professionals, it is uh, an advantage because we can talk with our colleagues and we can comment or ask any questions that we have related with all the patients. As we can see, next slide, we are in the unit two nurses, two doctors, one pharmacist and one psychiatrist. When in next slide, when you will see how do we organize the visits when a, when a patient comes for the first time to the unit, they visit the nurse. In next slide, you will see what do the nurse do. They register the parameters from the patient. They register temperature, size, weight, tension. They do an electrocardiogram. They calculate the Framingham score. They also ask about smoking habits. They uh, do analytics if it is necessary. And they also administer machines if it is necessary. This is also an advantage because patients do not have to do to the primary attention. After visiting the nurse, they, they visit the doctors who makes a complete exploration and some complementary medical tests, and then they determine the IKB stage. With all this information, the doctor prescribes an antiretroviral treatment. And in the next slide, you will see that the end of the visit is with pharmacy. In next slide, you will see um, our interview with the patient. For attending our patient as a hospital uh, pharmacy society, we are working in developing a new model attention. It is based in three dimensions, capacity, motivation, and opportunities with the patients. To attend this model, first of all, we classify our patients depending on their request. But these requests are not only based on the antiretroviral treatment, but also in characteristics of demographics, social, behavioral, pluripathology, immunobiological status, medication, physiological state, and functional state. The consequence is that we have the patients classified in three categories. Almost 60% of the patients are in base of the pyramid, so they do not need many requests. We have 30% of the patients who are in priority two, so they need more attention than those in priority three, but less than those in priority one. And approximately 10% of the patients are situated in the tip of the pyramid, so they really need a close attention and we dedicate more time and resources. In next slide, um, nevertheless, there are general points that we apply to all the patients, independently of the priority position they are classified. In chronic disease, such as IKB, self-management education has been shown to improve the treatment adherence, increase CD4 count, decrease viral load, and reduce risk-taking uh, behaviors. Carrying out motivational interviews during the patient's follow-up will allow patients to achieve their pharmacotherapeutic objectives. In next slide, before receiving the patient in our consultation, we validate the treatment. 
we check the dose paying attention in cases the patients have some renal impairments or hepatic impairments. We also search for resistant tests, tests and evaluate the treatment efficacy based on this information. In this slide, we not only validate treatment for individual patients, but also we collaborate in different commissions to evaluate and position new drugs. In the next slide, as a pharmacist, we also work to improve adherence and we evaluate that in two different ways. Indirect with the SMAC questionnaire and with their direct uh, interviews and re uh, register of the dispensation and with therapeutic drug monitoring. But we will talk more about that later. In next slide, to reinforce this adherence um, to, treat, um, to treatment, it is crucial to explain the patient what is the treatment for and what should they uh, hope taking it. With this simple fact, the adherence can be increased because they know what to expect about the treatment and the consequences of not taking it. Moreover, we always ask about any other concerns with the treatment and if they have any support, familiar, partner. With patients that have more adherence problems, we try to give them some easy tricks and share resources. We offer them the possibility to active a mobile alarm, to remark in a calendar when they have taken the pill uh, each day, and also we give them a pill organizer and teach them how to use it and to prepare it. After this, we always provide them our contact as a telephone number and we reprogram uh, for the next visit. If the patient is predisposed, we can visit they, them dial, daily, sorry, weekly or monthly um, for dispensation. Next slide. Since the appearance of highly active antiretroviral treatment, the morbidity and mortality associated with the disease has been drastically reduced, and patients' life expectancy has approached to general population ones. As a consequence, they present more comorbidities and they take treatment for other pathologies, with the consideration it could have with interactions. In next, in next slide, there are, there are also more, uh, predictive models that show that in 2030, more than 50% of the patients will uh, have prescribed more than one chronic medicines and more than 20% of the patients will have more than three chronic medicines. The most prescribed drugs are related with cardiovascular system diabetes and osteoporosis. In next slide, those are the reasons because every day is more important to check the interactions. In this study from Morillo et al, they describe also the family drugs more consumed in IKB population. The interaction checker between different drugs, like for example, lipid lowering medication, tuberculosis drugs, anxiolytics, and drugs for reflux, which are quite delicate while prescribing antiretroviral treatment with enhancers or rilpivirin. Not less important are the supplements or medic medicinal plants like uh, vitamins with metals containing um, or read just rice or the classical hyperic. In next slide, we offer to all the patients information about the side effects that treatment can cause, but also we advise them how to treat them and which are the aliments that they should avoid, for example, for ulcers in the mouth or a stomach. Next slide. We pay special attention to explain the patients how to take the treatment. If they have to take it once a day, twice a day, we also explain them if they have to take during the day with or without food, or if they have to take uh, before going to sleep. If the patient communicates us the use of some supplements, gym complement, or medicinal plants, we establish the timetable to take them if it is possible in relation with antiretroviral treatment. In next slide, we also provide patients prophylaxis pre-exposition. 
In addition to the general information, we explain the risk of, of other infections without the use of preservative, and a very important point related with initiation of the prophylaxis. They will probably not uh, be protect until seven days in case of men and 21 days in case of women, because the drug has not achieved the correct concentration in genital mucose. Next. Another support that we offer to the colleagues and the patients is information related with the possibility of crushing the pills for patients with the swallowing difficulties. So um, to be administered by mouth or by any type of, of tube. Next. If we detect patients' problems uh, which need to be attended by other specialists, we coordinate some visits, especially with psychiatric, because I say it is in the, he is in the unit, the smoking cessation unit, or with patients' associations. Next. As we already commend, we use therapeutic drug monitoring. This strategy is not recommended in guidelines to be used for clinical routine. The drugs we monitor are efavirenz, nevirapina, darunavir, lopinavir, tolutegravir, and atrazanavir, just in, situation, in the situations described in this slide. Next. As a group, we have some publications related with therapeutic drug monitoring, which describes the advantages of this tool for the patients. We also have established a range of efavirenz and darunavir above which the risk of higher cholesterol levels are achieved without benefits in IKB viral load. Next. Those are some other publications related with therapeutic drug monitoring from last years. Next. Finally, I will present two different cases. This one is the first, is a woman of 49 years old with a diagnosis of IKB from 2015. Nowadays, is in treatment with Victegravir and Tricitabine and Tenofovir. She has had always a good immunobiological control, but in March of this year, she presented an IKB viral load of 140 copies. We interviewed the patient, but she didn't explain any change with treatments, neither problems with other ends. After asking about any other supplements or medicinal plans, she take into account that she has been beginning to take a supplement with some minerals. We recommend uh, her to stop the, these supplements and we have a new control after a month. At this moment, she gets an indetectable viral load. The other example in the next slide is a woman of 52 years old in which you use therapeutic drug monitoring. As you can see, this patient has an extreme weight with 36 kilograms. She was taking emtricitabina, tenofovir, and nevirapina, 400 milligrams a day. With this dose uh, of nevirapina, the drug concentrations was, were higher of the objective range. So we decide finally to halve the dose with nevirapina, 200 milligrams a day. She maintained in drug branch and the infection was well controlled. Next, just thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pilar, for such a great presentation. It's always really good to see all the practicalities of a pharmacist working with uh, real uh, patients. So really good to see that uh, through this uh, case study. Thank you, Pilar. And now I'm going to introduce you to our last speaker. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to Katrina Orba. Uh, Dr. Olberg is an implementation scientist and assistant professor at the Fred Hutchinson Center. Uh, her research seeks to improve equity in health access with differentiated models of HIV service delivery in high prevalence settings. Her ongoing projects include a randomized trial that explores the use of HIV self-testing to decrease the number of pre-exposure prophylactic uh, clinic visits, 
a study to design and test novel model of pharmacy-based uh, prep delivery, and a study to design and test uh, peer prep referral plus HIV self-testing delivery model to increase prep uptake and continuation among uh, young women. These are all in Kenya. She uses diverse research methods across the fields of epidemiology, economics, uh, public policy, psychology, and implementation science. So uh, Katrina is going to uh, start her presentation, which is entitled Pharmacy Delivery to Expand the Reach of PrEP in the USA and Africa. Thank you very much, Katrina, for being with us today, and we look forward to listening to your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Victoria, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. And I just wanted to note that I'm going to present this work on behalf of a number of my research colleagues who collaborate with me on pharmacy, on models of pharmacy-based prep delivery, many of which you can see below. Next. Uh, as many of you know, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP is a relatively new HIV prevention intervention. Uh, so it was conditionally recommended by the WHO for certain populations in 2012. And then in 2017, um, it was recommended, it, it was approved in over 15 countries, including a number of Sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, however, despite these approvals, PrEP uptake still remains low and continuation over time also remains low. So the WHO is currently working on revising PrEP implementation guidelines um, and focusing on simplified models of PrEP delivery. Next. Uh, in most settings, when individuals want to initiate PrEP, they first have to go to a HIV clinic or a healthcare facility for PrEP initiation and continuation. And then they have to return to that facility every one to three months for PrEP refills and HIV testing to detect any potential breakthrough infect infections. Next. Um, however, with this model of PrEP delivery, a number of barriers exist, including stigma associated with visiting HIV clinics, especially if individuals are not or HIV uninfected, uh, limited hours of clinic operation, uh, long wait times and travel distances, especially at public facilities, which are often overcrowded, uh, and a lack of privacy um, additionally associated with overcrowding and the delivery of HIV-specific services in many low- and middle-income countries. Next. Thus, for this reason, we need differentiated models of PrEP service delivery that can help move PrEP outside of healthcare facilities uh, into new settings. So differentiated models can include changing the service frequency, changing the service delivery location, or also changing the cadre of worker that is delivering the services. Next. Uh, there's great potential for pharmacy-based PrEP delivery for a number of reasons outlined here. Uh, to begin with, in many low and middle income countries, uh, over 50% or roughly 50% of individuals first go to retail pharmacies to access healthcare services. Additionally, retail pharmacies can address both urgent needs like STI treatment, as well as preventive care needs like blood pressure testing. Uh, services are often also purchased at retail pharmacies that are available for free at public facilities like emergency contraception or other forms of contraception. And then finally, uh, pharmacy-based PrEP delivery is also of, of interest to many ministries of health, including the Kenya Ministry of Health, which is where we conduct most of our research. And the Kenya Ministry of Health actually approached, approached our research team because they were interested in delivering PrEP at retail pharmacies, but weren't quite sure how to do it and wanted some evidence to also prove that um, it was safe and effective. Next. Uh, so the WH it recently completed a systematic literature review looking at models of pharmacy-based prep delivery that was led by Caitlin Kennedy uh, and her team at John Hopkins. And in the systematic literature, reviewed the literature up to December 2020, and they found no effectiveness studies with a comparator arm. They found six case studies, which all showed feasibility of pharmacy-based prep delivery models, but just in the U.S., and then they identified 11 values and preferences studies, which largely found PrEP to be acceptable in diverse settings. And most of these studies were also in the US with the exception of three studies that were in Sub-Saharan African settings, including Kenya and South Africa. Next. This slide here highlights the six case studies that were completed in the United States and were captured in the systematic literature review. 
Uh, so these models of pharmacy prep delivery that were pilot tested in the US, most of them operated through a collaborative practice agreement where pharmacists delivered prep with remote clinician oversight. Uh, most of these prep programs also included client counseling and risk assessment, laboratory testing and prep dispensing. And the sample size for most of these pilots ranged from 50 to 700 clients with the majority being between 50 and 200 clients and one large study in Seattle being 700 clients. Uh, and prep initiation in these pilots ranged between 74 to 96% among those screened uh, and follow up in one month, one month ranged between 43 and 75%. Next. I want to highlight in particular, particular the model of pharmacy prep delivery that is ongoing in Seattle, which was the largest of these six pilot studies. Uh, this model is called the One Step Prep Program and it's happening at the Kelly Ross Pharmacy. At this, in this model, pharmacists can prescribe and refill prep using an eligibility checklist with remote clinician oversight. This model operates under a collaborative practice agreement like I previously discussed, and then clients with complex medical conditions or social issues are referred to a clinician for uh, follow-up care. The pilot study, which was conducted from March 2015 to February 2018, uh, in the study, over 700 clients were evaluated for HIV risk and screened, and 97% of them initiated PrEP. Uh, of all the clients screened, 74% of them initiated PrEP the same day, and most clients remained on PrEP for a little under a year, so 302 days. And I just wanted to highlight that this model is sustainable and it's still ongoing. So you can go to that website there to learn more about the One Step PrEP program going on in Seattle. Next. Uh, and Dr. Moody mentioned this earlier, but I just also wanted to highlight that in addition to these pilot studies, there's also been legislation passed in the United States to help reduce barriers to HIV prevention medication. So this particular bill, uh, Bill SB 159, allows retail pharmacies in California to dispense PrEP and PEP without a prescription. However, there's a big limitation to this bill, which is that pharmacy providers are only allowed to dispense 60 days of PrEP. And then after that, if individuals would like to continue on PrEP um, services, they have to get a prescription at a healthcare facility or other setting. Next. I want to highlight the three values and preferences studies that were captured in the review and completed in Sub-Saharan Africa. So two in Kenya and one in South Africa. Uh, one study in Kenya, which screened over 2000 members of the general population and asked them where they would most likely be interested in obtaining PrEP, found that roughly 40% of men and women said that they would, most be would be most interested in obtaining PrEP at retail pharmacies. A discrete choice experiment in South Africa found that women preferred accessing PrEP at public health clinics or health clinics, while men that had sex with men preferred accessing PrEP at retail pharmacies. And then a study that was conducted among stakeholders in Kenya found that stakeholders were enthusiastic about pharmacy-based PrEP delivery, and they were able to identify a number of perceived challenges and, and potential solutions to these challenges. And I want to highlight this last study because this was conducted with uh, members of my research team. And we worked closely with the Kenya Ministry of Health to develop a model of pharmacy-based prep delivery that would be acceptable and feasible to implement in Kenya. So I'll go through that process now. Next. So in January 2020, right before the pandemic, uh, we had a meeting with uh, roughly 20 stakeholders from the following organizations to convene and, and uh, collaboratively design a model of pharmacy-based prep delivery in Kenya. Next. From this meeting, we were able to identify five main core components of a pharmacy-based prep delivery model, which you can see here on the top. Uh, additionally, through a series of presentations and then small and large group discussions, we were able to identify potential challenges with delivering each of these core components in Kenya at the moment, uh, and also identify a number of both short-term and long-term solutions. So short-term solutions that could be addressed in a pilot study, and then long-term solutions that would be needed to that would need to be addressed for scale up of pharmacy-based prep delivery. Next. So I want to take you through, for example, uh, HIV testing, for example. Uh, so in this, in this meeting, we identified that right now, a challenge to HIV testing at retail pharmacies were that there's no guidelines for rapid testing at pharmacies in Kenya, and technically uh, HIV testing, uh, blood-based testing with rapid diagnostic testing is not allowed. So the short-term solution for the pilot study was to select retail pharmacies that are certified to provide assisted HIV self-testing, 
uh, in Kenya and to allow these pharmacies special permission to deliver PrEP based on this HIV self-test result uh, versus the rapid diagnostic test, which is the current standard of care in Kenya and other settings. And then the long-term solution would be to have the Ministry of Health develop guidelines that can enable pharmacy providers to um, complete rapid tests uh, in, in the setting. Next. At the end of this meeting, we were able to collaboratively design a care pathway for pharmacy-based PrEP delivery in Kenya. And this care pathway was largely based off the one-step um, PrEP program in, in Seattle, at the Kelly Ross Pharmacy that I presented earlier. So it also operated by using a prescribing checklist, many of the items which you can see here, which, um, which allowed pharmacists to screen clients for HIV risk, determine clinical safety, complete HIV testing, and dispense PrEP, all with remote clinician oversight. And then any clients with you know, complex medical conditions or any indication, any conditions that might uh, lead to contraindications with PrEP use would be referred to a healthcare facility for PrEP initiation and continuation. Next. Right now, there's a number of feasibility studies that are currently ongoing uh, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, which you can see here. Uh, and Dr. Moody presented what's happening with PMART in South Africa. There's also a pilot study that's ongoing um, that's about to start in Kampala. But what I'm going to do uh, with the rest of my presentation is highlight the studies that are completed, ongoing, and planned in Kenya, which many members of my research team have uh, participated in. Next. So right now in Kenya, there's three studies or three pilot studies of pharmacy-based PrEP delivery that have either been recently completed or are ongoing, and we plan on completing um, end of December, end of this month. So the first was a nurse delivered model of PrEP delivery. So nurses in Kenya um, are already legally allowed to prescribe PrEP and complete HIV testing. So the sort of most feasible uh, option, but also has cost implications was to just take one of these nurses and station them at a retail pharmacy and have them deliver PrEP in Kenya. So that's the first model. The second model was to have individuals initiate PrEP at a public HIV clinic and then be referred to nearby pharmacies for PrEP refills only, uh, with the idea being that PrEP initiation is a slightly more medically complex interaction than the refill visits. And then the third model is a standalone model um, of pharmacy-based PrEP delivery, where the pharmacy providers both initiate and continue clients on PrEP. And the last two models we plan on completing end of December and presenting these findings soon at international HIV conferences. Next. But I wanted to highlight the findings from the nurse navigator model, which was presented at IAS this past summer. So this, the, the findings from this pilot study, which was led by Julian Pinte, were really exciting. So from October 2020 to March 2021, at three retail pharmacies in Kusumu, Kenya, uh, PrEP was delivered just to adolescent girls and young women that were seeking contraceptive services in these studies. And what we found is that uh, for young women um, accessing contraceptive services at pharmacies compared to family planning clinics in Kasumu, there was a significant difference in the type of contraception that these women were using. Was women at the retail pharmacies using, uh, more, more often using shorter, for, shorter term uh forms of contraception like condoms and emergency contraception, and the women at the family planning clinics were often accessing longer acting forms of contraception. Uh, but what was, all, what was really exciting is when these women were offered PrEP at the retail pharmacies, 87% of women that were offered PrEP um, accepted PrEP and started using PrEP, while at the family planning clinics, only 4% of women that were offered PrEP accepted PrEP and started using PrEP. Next. I want to highlight two studies that are planned in Kenya uh, that we are hoping to launch in 2020. The first is a pilot study testing a model of online PrEP delivery, which we were conducting in collaboration with Madawa, which is an online pharmacy retailer in uh, Kenya. And in this model, clients will screen for PrEP eligibility via the Madawa platform, uh, receive an HIV self-test at a setting of their choice, and then if they test negative, connect with a remote clinician via Madawa, and then um, at following that visit, have, a, have PrEP delivered to them at a setting of their choice, and then engage in PrEP support services via Madawa. So um, this is a really exciting new model of PrEP delivery, and, it's, and we're hoping to launch this pilot in April 2022. Next. 
Additionally, we plan on completing a cluster randomized trial and also starting this uh, at the end of 2022. This cluster randomized trial is, is testing the model of brick and mortar pharmacy-based prep delivery. So the standard of care arm will be pharmacist referral to existing clinic-based services, which is what is currently available in Kenya at the moment. And then we'll have two intervention arms, one where pharmacy providers will deliver prep for free, and one where pharmacy providers will deliver prep for a small fee determined at the pharmacy level. Uh, additionally, in the intervention arms, uh, in a subset of intervention pharmacies, we will also add a nurse navigator to try to understand the additional benefits of having nurse navigators at these pharmacies. Next. One thing I just wanted to mention briefly is uh, HIV self-testing for PrEP delivery. So right now the WHO does not recommend HIV self-testing to be used uh, as a tool for PrEP prescribing. So HIV self-testing is currently only categorized as a screening tool. So in a number of countries, including Kenya and other sub-Saharan African countries, uh, rapid diagnostic testing is the standard of care, but you can see here that a number of the HIV self-tests, especially the blood-based HIV self-tests, have very similar sensitivity and specificity to rapid diagnostic testing. And a number of these models, especially the online model of pharmacy prep delivery, uh, hinges on a, enabling HIV self-testing to be used for prep initiation. So more research is needed to understand if HIV self-testing can be used as a, as a tool to inform prep prescribing rather than just a screening tool. Next. So in summary, pharmacy-based prep delivery is an exciting new prep delivery platform that has been demonstrated to be acceptable in the US and Africa and feasible in the US. Uh, bar current barriers to scale up include a lack of evidence on effectiveness of pharmacy-based versus clinic-based prep services, costs associated with pharmacy-based prep delivery, and regulatory barriers surrounding the use of HIV self-testing for prep prescribing. Uh, additionally, more implementation research on the feasibility of diverse pharmacy-based models in uh, several African countries is coming soon, including cost-effectiveness analyses, modeling studies, and randomized trials. Next. So thanks so much for listening to this presentation. Uh, and I just wanted to, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or a number of my, or either of my African um, research colleagues, uh, Dr. Kenneth Ngure, who's at the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, and Dr. Elizabeth Bakusi, who's at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, who have been collaborating with me on all this research. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katrina, for a really informative presentation. Uh, definitely, uh, PrEP is a key strategy to fight HIV, and as presented, pharmacies uh, can have an important role uh, to play with uh, PrEP services provision. And definitely agree that more implementation research is needed um, to integrate uh, these services into routine practice. So I would like to thank you very much to our wonderful uh, panelists uh, today. Uh, we had uh, panelists, as you could see, from different uh, sides of the world. So we had uh, panelists from Switzerland, Spain, South Africa, USA. And I will give a very brief overview before we jump into the Q&A session. So first, uh, Tisa um, and Nelly uh, provided uh, an overview of frontline health workers who deliver HIV prevention and care to stigmatize uh, populations and uh, strategies to reduce HIV stigma and presented really um, inspiring videos. Then we had uh, Shan Mudley from South Africa who presented an overview of HIV in South Africa and explained uh, pharmacies initiated management of antiretroviral uh, therapy. Then we had Pilar Taverner, who explained all the details of how pharmacies can improve the quality of life of patients with HIV through, through a pharmacist-led service in a hospital setting. And finally, Katrina uh, has provided an overview of uh, PrEP interventions, which have or are currently being assessed in uh, controlled environments and uh, um, PrEP service in uh, Kenya. So thank you very much again to our speakers and also for sticking to our presentation time. And I'm now going to open 
the Q&A session. So we currently have, I'm inviting all our speakers to turn on their cameras for the Q&A session. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Sham, uh, the first question is for you. So thank you for your impor informative presentation. Allow me to ask you about the transition from pet PAR strategy to day eight uh, IS2, if you can clarify about that. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. And I think it's a good question uh, because uh, critically to making any program work in a country, you certainly need uh, the platform that goes across uh, all the sectors. So the district health information software uh, that the question is about is utilized in South Africa and I think in many other parts of the world, uh, quite an effective system that the public sector is using. Unfortunately, um, integrating platforms at the moment uh, between public and private doesn't exist in South Africa. Um, the system that we did build to utilize in um, uh, Pumat is certainly able uh, to cross over information when uh, the Department of Health determines what that relationship is going to be. So we did present the program to the previous Minister of Health, who's now gone, uh, but uh, and he was really excited about it. And we did discuss the information flow from the private sector to the public sector. So while the system is built to integrate, it is not quite integrated yet. And hopefully that will be something that we will look at when the De uh, Department of Health allows for the integration to take place. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sham. Um, our next question is for Pilar. By the evidence-based research that you showed before as a pharmacist, how can we make it to the public health policy? Is it our job or is it the public health job on the decision-making? Because pharmacists voice in my country are unheard. Thank you. Okay, I think as a pharmacist, we, we have a lot to say no, in this way. And even if I know that it is quite difficult to let us hear from governments, we are really well prepared to interpret uh, the studies, refer to efficacy and all, also security. So first of all, I think as a pharmacist, we should form part of these commissions in public health system. And I know it's difficult to get there, but moreover, after the government uh, have taken a decision of the new drugs, we still have a lot to say in this, uh, about these new drugs. Um, position them in our uh, area of, of work. We th I think that we have to know all the alternative disponibles so we can uh, work with our colleagues, developing protocols or developing some recommendation and um, also having into consideration all this part of security. I think starting from here, uh, they will hear us uh, more. Thank you very much, Pilar. Uh, our next question, I think it is for everyone. Uh, what is the progress so far for the development of a vaccine for HIV? If anybody has any updates on this important topic. So let me just attempt um, to put a view on it. I don't have the latest discussion around uh, the availability of the vaccine. Certainly for South Africa, there has been a long struggle to produce something. Uh, and there's a lot of data around uh, what has the work that has been done. But as far as I'm aware, there isn't a vaccine. Um, and uh, obviously currently with the COVID issue, uh, there's always the discussion about why have we not progressed after 20 years uh, in the HIV field with the vaccine, but we've done so with, uh, with COVID very quickly. So um, I think it's something that we need to continue to talk about, but certainly on my side of it, I'm not aware of a vaccine that is uh, imminent. 
Thank you, Sham. I believe Nelly has also provided a response. Nelly, if you would like to uh, explain it a bit further. Yes, thank you. Uh, today, IAS um, has launched um, the third edition of the Research Priorities for HIV Cure, which is an IAS global scientific strategy, and it's been published uh, in Nature Medicine. I will drop the hyperlink into the chat, and I would recommend, if you're interested to learn more about this, just to visit uh, the hyperlink on the it describes kind of the, the, the critical gaps, the progress that has been made, the next steps uh, the, 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 in science that we you know, must follow towards more scalable and affordable um, global uh, accessible <laughs> cure. Um, and there are quite a number of strategies there listed, as well as if you're interested to uh, listen to a podcast that IS has just launched today, it's uh, HIV Unmuted. And I will also drop a link there where we have our our president-elect Sharon Lewin speaking on the latest cure strategies. Um, and we will have uh, also um, Adam, the London patient, and his doctor speak more about um, some of the feasibilities and not feasibilities of cure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nelly, uh, for the answer. Um, do we have any more questions uh, from our attendees? I have one question for Katrina. Uh, I was very surprised to see that there were no comparative act effectiveness studies in the lead review that uh, you showed. Why do you think that's the case? Yeah, I think that these models of pharmacy-based prep delivery are, are very new. So I think that, you know, it's PrEP itself is a relatively new intervention and then delivering it in pharmacies, you know, for, for a long time, it's been sort of tightly regulated and controlled and delivered versus public at, at uh, HIV clinics. So I think these models of pharmacy PrEP delivery are new, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, sort of we're just doing sort of pilot studies and feasibility studies. So I think this, this effect, these effectiveness trials are coming um, and we're, our team is working on one um, now in Kenya. So stay tuned. Thank you very much, Katrina. So I don't think we have any more questions from our attendees. So Victoria, can I, yes, if you don't yes, mind, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can I comment on the question before, which was related to the fact that pharmacists don't have a voice in their country, especially in public health. Um, and maybe um, some strategies that we are utilizing in South Africa around the issue of community pharmacy and public health. Uh, the one thing is for the pharmacy associations to put it on their agenda. So that's a starting point uh, to make public health a key deliverable out of community pharmacies. Uh, so that's what we did as a strategy. And then to sit with teams of people within the association to then look at the different areas. So we started with, for example, uh, national health insurance, which is universal health coverage in South Africa is gonna be done by that system. We developed a document which we submitted to, to, to government and offered uh, what we could do for government in, in terms of that strategy. The second was uh, the vaccine rollout. We were the first to put our hands up to suggest that we could do this. And as you can see, South Africa community pharmacy is the largest provider outside of the state of uh, vaccines. Um, the next was looking at communicable and non-communicable diseases which government struggles with, many government struggles with, and to put documents on the agenda of the government. Um, as soon as we did that with, with, for example, HIV, we started doing testing in pharmacy uh, in a project called STAR. You can Google that and check that. Uh, then we started to do um, medicine delivery where the state sent their medicines to the pharmacy and we then uh, offered it to the patients. The patients would come and collect their medication. So we started involving ourselves in the public profile uh, of, uh, of patients and of the government uh, as we went along. And I think that has built to where now the department is now looking at uh, having pharmacists recommend first-line treatment together with PrEP and PEP. Um, so I think that might be helpful to countries that want to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sham. Really important indeed uh, to identify uh, and met needs and uh, show how pharmacies can contribute to addressing this. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there are no more questions, I'm going to ask our panelists to have uh, some final thoughts and closing remarks before we finish uh, our session. So perhaps we can uh, just follow the order of our presentations. So uh, Nelly, if you would like to have some closing remarks uh, regarding your presentation. Yes, thank you, uh, Victoria, and thank you, um, FIP, for letting us be here and present on the uh, on this very important topic and uh, of today of all days. So I just want to encourage all of you to um, try as far as you can to provide stigma-free services in healthcare settings to all. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. I'm going now to ask uh, Tessa about your uh, some key messages that you would like to throw to our audience. Thank you, Victoria, and thank you, FIP, for, for, for the invitation. And um, it was great to also hear the, the great work that all of our colleagues in the different countries are doing. Uh, with regards to this day on World Day AIDS Day, it's um, absolutely fantastic that uh, you were able to put this event together. And um, this is very much an opportunity for us to continue the conversation on how best to collaborate from research to pe uh, people in, 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 in healthcare settings and make sure we move forward um, in our, our fight against, um, against HIV-related stigma and moving the HIV response forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, Sham, what are your closing remarks? Thank you very much. Uh, and again, um, congratulations to FIP on hosting uh, such uh, uh, an event on such an important day. Um, and I think for me, what, has, um, what is key is the fact that there are many um, small projects that are happening across the world. Uh, and I think maybe from an FIP position, uh, especially on the CPS side, uh, we maybe need to want to accumulate all of this information and try to piece together documentation around uh, the role of pharmacists in the uh, HIV pandemic and come up with strategies so that we have a comprehensive document that community pharmacy can use across the world. Uh, so that probably would be a recommendation that might come out of this uh, today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sham. And now Pilar. Okay, so I think that nowadays we are in a new situation because we are fortunate to say that um, IKB patients have a chronic uh, disease with all the meanings that it has, like comorbidities and the attention we have to pay in that um, related uh, with interactions and uh, our great work to do with that. And we have to change the, the model to attend our patients, not based only on the uh, antiretroviral treatment, but also in all the context that they have. So I think we have to try to focus on all that. And also we have um, to see to the future with the new drugs and the new ways to administer them and how can this change in their life, their life and work a lot in adherence because as a chronic disease, that is a, a really important point. Thank you, Pilar. And finally, Katrina. Thank you so much, FIP, for inviting me here today to present uh, and give an overview of pharmacy prep delivery on behalf of uh, the research teams that I work with um, in Kenya and elsewhere. And I just, you know, I think to end the HIV epidemic, we really need to focus on reaching populations that are not accessing traditional health services. And as you saw from the presentation today, uh, a lot of individuals are, are telling us that they want to be able to access these HIV medications at retail pharmacies. And I think what we're also finding from some preliminary findings is that you're accessing a totally different population of individuals at retail pharmacies that might never go to HIV clinics to access their drugs. So I think this is like a really exciting new delivery platform that we should explore to try to access those populations that are not currently in patient care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrina. And thank you again to all our panelists. I would like to share with you all the positive comments that we are getting and have been getting through your presentations from the audience. So they are all uh, sharing with you that it is it has been a great session uh, with very informative presentations. So our audience has enjoyed. 
um, the session, which I'm glad, uh, very glad to hear. And uh, thank you to our audience as well for participating and uh, for being with us today. I hope you have enjoyed uh, this session, really important session in the uh, World AIDS Day. So just a reminder that um, this presentation has been recorded and it's available on the FIP website and you can keep up to date uh, for future FIP digital events on our website. So thanks again and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.